Let's take a look at what happens under the hood when you call printf, what happens inside of the Linux kernel, and finally, how does it get printed on the screen? For this, I'm going to use GDB. I'm going to debug the kernel. I have here the guide from the Linux kernel docs. We're going to follow it, and I'm going to start by configuring the kernel for GDB. For this, I'm going to go over here where I cloned the kernel. I'm going to put information about everything in the description. I'm going to start by running make and then def config. And this will initialize a default configuration. Afterwards, we're going to run make and then many config. I'm going to scroll here to the bottom and press enter on kernel hacking. Afterwards, I'm going to press enter on compiler options over here. Debug information, I'm going to set to default dwarf version. Press enter on this. I'm going to also press space on this line, provide GDB scripts. This will be useful. Let's finally exit and save the changes. Now I'm going to start the build by running make. I'm going to also use minus J8 to make it faster. Notice that in my case, though, it's going to run really fast because I already built the kernel. Now we can see that the BZ image is ready. This is the kernel that we're going to use. Now let's go back to the guide for a sec. Another important thing here is that we're going to run make scripts GDB. This will prepare the GDB scripts we're going to use. Now let's go ahead and prepare the user space. So I'm going to make a simple program that will just print hello world. So I have here an empty directory, I call it distro. Let's create a new file, let's call it init.c. We're gonna make a simple call for printf. So I'm gonna use stdio. Start my main function over here. Now let's go ahead and save this. And I'm gonna build this using GCC. I'm gonna pass in minus static. This is important because this will be the only executable in our user space, so it has to be static and the output is just going to be named init. Now we have here an init executable. We can go ahead and run this. Works fine. Also notice that if I use strace on the init executable, we can see the system calls that are initiated by this executable. Specifically, this is the main one we're interested in. It's called write. Even though we call printf, under the hood, printf eventually uses write because write is what is actually implemented in the kernel. You can see that one of the parameters here is the hello world we use with printf. And the first parameter is the file descriptor. In the case of SCD out, it's file descriptor number one. By the way, you can find more information about system calls by just using the man page category two, passing the system call name, for example, right. And you can see here are the parameters and more information about this. Anyway, we're gonna take a look at where this is implemented inside of the kernel. Before that, I want to prepare the init ramifs because now we need to create the init ramifs archive so the kernel can work with this. For this, we can use the CPIO utility. I'm going to first pass in the file that I want to use. In this case, it's going to be init. That's going to be only one file, so I'm going to echo init. I'm going to pipe this into CPIO. Minus H is going to be new C. That's going to be the format. New C is the format that is supported by the kernel. Minus O is going to tell CPIO to create a new archive. Finally, I'm going to pipe this into init.cpio. Now we got the archive right over here. This is our init ramifs, and it contains only a single file, and that is the init executable we just built. Now let's go back to the directory we built Linux. Let's take a quick look at the source code. I'm going to show you something. So we're going to go to the fs directory and read write.c. Over here, let's navigate to sys and then write. We can see how we have here the cases write function. We're going to see where this is used. And we can see here the syscall define three macro. This defines a new system call. System call is called write, and here are the parameters. By the way, we have here the three because the write system call has three parameters. And we can see how the way that write is implemented is that it just calls cases write. So we know from here that in order to actually understand what is going on, we're gonna put a breakpoint on this function. Now let's start GDB with the VM Linux, as they tell us over here in the debugging guide. Also notice that you may need to configure the safe path like it says over here. I have it configured in the GDB init file. We're telling GDB that it's fine to load stuff from this directory. This is the directory I have Linux clone in. So now I'm gonna start GDB like this. And finally, after it read the symbols from VM Linux, the GDB prompt should start. So now GDB is configured for kernel debugging. Now it's time to start the kernel. For this, I'm gonna use QMU, system x86-64. I'm gonna pass minus kernel, pass in the path to the BZ image we just built. That is an arch x86-64. Second parameter is going to be init rd. Here I'm going to pass the init ramifs we built. We put this in distro and then init.cpio. Afterwards, I'm going to pass minus s and minus capital S. 
These flags will tell QMU to wait for the debugger to connect and also to start suspended. Finally, I'm going to use minus append. This will enable me to pass in more command line parameters for the kernel. And I'm going to pass in no KASLR. This will disable a security feature that is called KASLR. ASLR stands for Address Space Layout Randomization. And this is a security feature which changes the address the kernel is loaded into each time the kernel boots. But this will confuse the debugger, so I'm going to just disable it. Now we can go ahead and run this. You can see now that QMU is paused. It's waiting for the debugger to connect. So we can go ahead and close this. And now I'm going to connect with GDB. So I'm going to run target remote, connect to port 1234. And you can see now we're successfully connected. So I'm going to start by placing a breakpoint with the break command. It's going to be on ksys right, as we saw before. This is where the write system call is implemented. Now I'm going to run continue. It's going to continue the boot of the kernel. And now you can see the kernel is booting right over here. And now you can see the breakpoint was hit. And indeed, the last line that the kernel printed over here was run init as init process. So now the kernel is in the middle of running our init process that we just wrote. And we can see here in the parameters that indeed this is the hello world that we wrote. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the list command. This will show me the lines of code over here. And I'm going to press enter to see more of the code. What we can see here in the code is that it starts by checking which file is related to the file descriptor that was passed. And it gets back this structure that is called fd. And then it's doing a bunch of initialization and eventually calling vfs write. To dive in deeper, what I'm interested at is diving into this function, vfs write. And for this, I'm going to use the advance command, pass in the function I want to advance to. What this command will do is basically continue the execution until it arrives at this function. Now let's go ahead and run list over here. And we can see it does a bunch of stuff, but I'm specifically interested in diving into this function, new sync write, because I want to continue diving deeper. So I'm going to advance to here. Now from here on, I'm going to fast forward the video, because I want to focus on how this interacts in the end with the display on the lower level. But it's basically more of the same, stepping through the code and eventually arriving over there. Here I'm using, by the way, finish, because I'm not interested in the hardware timer interrupt. So I want to get past this code. Finish just goes until the end of the function. By the way, notice that we're now starting to step through the driver code. Now I arrive at the function that is called conWrite. This is getting pretty close to the code that is interacting with the low-level display. And now notice over here on line 3010, we have the screen write w function. This actually looks like a function, but it's not a function. We're going to see in a second, this is a macro. This is a macro that basically assigns this value into this place in memory. So if I just run the frame command, this is a gdb command that will show me where I'm currently at. So we're at the vt driver file. And let's advance to this line. So I'm going to go to line 3010. Now we're at the line with the macro over here. As you can see over here, I have the OS dev wiki open, specifically on the text UI page. Let's go to the section here that talks about video mode. You can see a popular choice for the video mode that is used when using VGA is VGA mode 3. And this allows direct memory access. Basically, we write characters to memory and they're displayed on the screen. It's pretty simple. And we're going to mess a little with the colors. And this is how it looks like with the colors. Also, this line is important. Each character that is written takes two bytes of space in memory. And we're going to see that in a second. First byte is split into two segments. This is related to the colors, the four color and the back color. Second byte is just the ASCII value of the character. So we're going to see that it correlates to the hello world that we're writing on the screen. And we can easily modify the colors by just modifying the second byte with numbers according to this table. So we're going to play around with this a bit. Let's now go back to the code. So I'm going to run here frame again. And the interesting thing here is the TC variable. You can see that this is passed into the screen write w macro and this is written to this address in memory. And we want to go ahead and modify the colors. Now, this is not really helpful, the fact that it's displayed in decimal. So I'm going to print this in hex. I'm going to use for this the print command, so print slash x and then tc. This is how this looks like in hex. Now let's open up Python for a sec. And let's check out the character of 48 in hex. And you can see how this is h. This correlates with the h that we have in our hello world. So now we know that this byte relates to the character. So this byte must relate to the color. Now if we go here to the table, we can see that 7 correlates to gray. So let's change this, for example, to red. So we're just going to put 4 over there. But something funny, sometimes you can change variables simply using gdb. But in this case, it's not going to let you. We're going to see this like this. For example, if we assign this to be 448 instead of 748 in hex, GDB is not going to let us. 
it's gonna tell me that it's not L value. It's probably because this variable is somehow optimized out. We're gonna have to dive in a little bit to the assembly. First of all, notice that I'm currently on this line. So I can print out the current instruction I'm on by using x slash i. x is examine and i is instruction. So I'm examining the current instruction by passing in dollar and then PC. PC stands for program counter. And you can see the current line I'm on is this assembly line. Now default syntax over here of assembly is at and I don't really like at and syntax, so I'm gonna set this to Intel. So I'm gonna use set disassembly flavor and Intel. Now if I run the same command, it'll be more fun to read. Now this only displays the current instruction. I wanna display a couple of the next instructions, so I'm gonna run instead of just i, I'm gonna use 10i, for example. Display the next 10 instructions. I'm gonna close here the Python. So the current line correlates to a couple of assembly instructions, but notice that the only instruction in this area that actually writes them something to memory is this line. So we're gonna advance into this line and modify the R10W register. To do that, we're gonna figure out the address of this line, which is right over here. On the left is the address in memory, but this is the address that is more human readable. I'm gonna use the advance command. Notice I'm gonna put a star over here. That is because we're talking about a memory address and paste this. Now, if I take a look at the current instruction I'm on, I'm on this instruction right over here. So now I can go ahead and modify this register right before it's writing this into the screen memory. So I'm gonna start by showing you what is currently inside of this register and it will look familiar. By the way, notice I'm preceding registers with a dollar before. This is a 748 that we saw before. Seven is the gray color and we're gonna change this to red. How we're gonna do that? I'm gonna change the seven to be four. So I can use the same print, except I can use an equal sign over here and assign this to be whatever I want. Let's say 448. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a breakpoint on the same line I'm currently at. By the way, I can just use B to place breakpoints. I don't have to write break each time. And I'm gonna put a star over here because this is an address in memory. And I'm just gonna run continue to continue execution. You can see that breakpoint was hit again, but if I take a look at Linux right now, you can see I indeed printed a character that is red. So it worked. This is really cool. Let's take a look at how we can make it green now. So I'm gonna do the same thing that we did before, except instead of four, I'm gonna put it here too. Now I'm gonna run continue. And now we got a green character. Same for blue. So blue is one. I just put in one. And we have a blue character. 